So I want to introduce now John Chen. He earned his PhD in history. Uh, by the way, his, his bio in our uh, sheet is outdated uh, because he has earned his PhD in history from Columbia University in 2018. So congratulations. That's very good. In 2018-2019, he will hold the William Theodore de Berry Postdoctoral Fellowship in Columbia's Department of East Asian Languages and Cultures. John's research focuses on Islam and Muslims in China in the context of broader Asian and global histories. His dissertation is the first book-length study of modern Chinese Muslims to rely systematically on published and archival sources in both Chinese and Arabic. John has lived over two years in Beijing for dissertation research and language study, a year and a half in Cairo for training at the Center for Arabic Study Abroad, both supported by Fulbright friends. I can only imagine trying to become fluent in both Arabic and Chinese. Um, Nobody quite, said anything quite about fluent. Quite an accomplishment. <laughs> I said try. I've been, at, I've been at, at Arabic for like 25 years, and it's my little personal jihad, but anyway. <laughs> He has also worked at the Council of Foreign Relations in New York and interned at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C. He received his A.B. from Harvard University in 2008, specializing in history and Arabic. So welcome, John Chen. Thank you very much, uh, Susan, for the invitation and the, the introduction um, and for organizing all this. I'm very, very happy to be here. Um, <clears throat> It's after lunch, so I'll do my best to be uh, <laughs> dynamic. What um, we left the coffee okay. <laughs> So who are the Muslims of China? Uh, many people have asked this question, including the Chinese Muslims themselves. <laughs> I want to give you two facts to start out. First, there are over 20 million Muslims currently in China, uh, about That's twice the population of Tunisia, slightly, and slightly less uh, than the, pop the population of Yemen. Um, Second, communities of Muslims, um, uh, as Harrison covered, uh, have lived in China probably for 1,300 years, as nearly as long as Islam has existed. Uh, there's a dissonance between um, what incredible facts those are uh, and um, how little the history of Islam and Muslims in Asia, uh, let alone China, um, is taught in our educational system. Until now. Sorry. <laughs> Tough crowd. <crap>. Okay. <laughs> In this talk, uh, <laughs> I'm going to try to suggest how and to what extent um, this topic could be taught more, uh, and also offer some thoughts uh, of mine on why it should be taught more. Uh, with respect to my title, The Worldliest Minority, uh, Chinese Muslims have, at various points in time, sought to be, uh, or to portray themselves as, the link between the great civilizations of Islam and China. Others, including various Chinese governments, um, have also tried at times to portray them. Uh, as that. Um, today, a common refrain in, in official accounts, even among some Chinese Muslims themselves, uh, is that Chinese Muslims descended from Arabs who migrated to China, intermarried, and brought about a peaceful dialogue between uh, Islamic civilization, assumed to be Arab-centric, and Chinese civilization, assumed to be Confucian uh, or Han-centric. And this progressed smoothly and resulted in the formation of the Huizu, uh, or the Chinese Muslim minority nationality. Um, as much as it's my goal to give you, uh, you know, usable material, uh, it's also my goal to resist or to historicize uh, this kind of, um, you know, civilizational uh, thinking. My main point today uh, will be um, that, as with China itself, and as with any imagined community, we shouldn't uh, just take the history of Islam and Muslims in China to be that of a unitary entity. Uh, progressing inevitably toward a clear collective destiny. Uh, their backgrounds were in our plural, their self-understandings were in our plural, their roles in Chinese state and society were in our plural, uh, and their connections to the outside world were in our, you guessed it, plural. Um, <clears throat> so if you take one thing away from my talk, I hope it will be that there's a tremendous amount of contingency, uh, discontinuity, uh, and diversity in Chinese Islamic history uh, as well as in Islamic and Chinese history, both general. Uh, <clears throat> uh, one thing I just want to cover uh, quickly, build on what uh, uh, Harrison said also, uh, the Hui versus the Uyghurs. Um, so today I'll be talking primarily about the people who are currently called the Hui, uh, or Chinese-speaking Muslims, and more tangentially about the people currently called the Uyghurs. 
Uh, but I want you to keep in the back of your minds that uh, these identities have been very fluid over time. Um, and people will also often say uh, that you know the Chinese Muslims or the Hui are the model minority. They're integrated, they're peaceful, they live throughout the country, they're interested in learning Chinese, uh, and so on. Uh, and therefore, they've been treated better by the Chinese government. Whereas the Uyghurs, or the Turkic-speaking Muslims, live primarily in uh, the northwest province, now known as Xinjiang, uh, and are less well integrated and uh, are less interested in integrating. Um, you can see some of that thinking in the, oh, I'm sorry, this is in French. <laughs> it's, the best, uh, it's the best map I could find. Um, down here they say, the Hui, Musulman Sinisei, the Sinicized Muslims, uh, an asset of, BK, uh, of, uh, of Beijing um, in relations with the Islamic world. Um, meanwhile, the Uyghurs, perceived by Beijing as a, an internal menace. Um, so, uh, you know, I would actually turn, I, I obviously want to say as a story, it's, it's much more complicated than that, um, but I also want to turn those conceptions on their head and, and say, for example, you know, Western media often describes Xinjiang as a restive region. See, this, this word is ubiquitous, uh, right, in, in the news, uh, much like Tibet, you know, the restive regions. Um, if you look at, uh, as Harrison also said, if you look at the history, you would see that conquered might be a much more accurate uh, word. <laughs> Um, and I would, uh, I would add that uh, the Chinese state today does distinguish between these two groups. Uh, that wasn't always the case. Uh, but it still has many misperceptions about both. Um, and in, in general, the government, I think, does fear the Hui less, uh, although recently they have begun to surveil them uh, and restrict their movement in, in, uh, in, in certain ways. Uh, the Uyghurs, meanwhile, uh, always had cultural contact with China, but uh, as Harrison mentioned, the, um, the territory that's now Xinjiang, uh, or um, Eastern Turkestan, was only incorporated into a Chinese polity for the first time in the mid-18th century, the Qing conquest. Uh, that's very, very recent uh, for the cultures we're talking about. Um, another thing I want to say by way of introduction, this is not actually a new topic. Uh, European and American missionaries, Orientalists, diplomats, and adventurers wrote a lot about Islam in China uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century. I can say more about this if people are interested. Um, <clears throat> not long thereafter, in the early 20th century, Chinese Muslims and non-Muslim Chinese also began writing and speaking about Chinese Islamic history in modern forms, books, newspapers, uh, even on the radio. Um, <clears throat> we'll talk more uh, later about what prompted them to do that. Also, in the last 30 years or so, uh, academic work on this topic uh, in the United States, Europe, and Australia has been actually quite rich. Um, but that said, there, there are still many gaps uh, in our understanding. So long story short, the topic is not actually good. <clears throat> um, I can say more about who these guys are <laughs> if people are interested. OK, topic's not actually new. But Sorry, this sounds a little contrived. There is a renewed urgency in discussing the topic uh, for two reasons. Okay. The first, of course, is Chinese politics and foreign policy. Uh, the um, policy of expansion of the one belt and one road. Uh, not only that, uh, in Xinjiang right now, there are concentration camps, re-education camps, and restriction on people's movement um, in the context of an expanding uh, surveillance state generally. <clears throat> this is happening right now. Uh, nor is this just a matter of domestic policy. China's cooperation with the countries of Asia and the Islamic world is becoming more about security, uh, not just about commerce. For a long time, people said Chinese aid and Chinese business uh, come with no strings attached. Uh, the request last July that Egypt help deport Uyghur students studying at Al-Azhar in Cairo, the Millennium Center, uh, the Millennium Old Center of Islamic Learning, uh, Sure sounds to me like strings attached. Uh, and China's relationships uh, with the Middle East, um, the Islamic world, uh, and um, its own Muslims, as all this suggests, uh, are only going to get more prominent uh, and more fraught as time goes on, um, as China pursues natural resources, as we've heard about uh, commercial gain and um, political and economic influence, and as the roles the United States has played in the world since 1945 become untethered or unhinged as the case may be. 
um, those changes will further complicate China's relations with the Middle East, the Islamic world, and Asia. Uh, and as that happens, <coughs> uh, the ambivalence that the peoples of the Middle East and the Islamic world feel toward China, uh, I think, will grow more acute uh, because the question, um, as uh, we also heard in the last presentation, um, the question will be whether China uh, can provide any kind of favorable alternative to the United States or whether it will engage in the same forms of, forgive me, hypocrisy and interventionism as its American and European predecessors. Um, for these reasons, uh, for all these reasons, it will be very important for students uh, in the future to have some sense of what this is all about. That leads me to my second reason for uh, the urgency of this topic, which is our pedagogies and curricula themselves. Uh, I'm glad Susan mentioned uh, the, the question right now with the AP World History curriculum, uh, dividing it into ancient and modern. Um, although, uh, you know, maybe there's no ideal solution to that. Uh, question, I, I fear the result of dividing it into ancient and modern um, will, the result will be that students will know considerably less about the world before 1500. That is the world before European dominance, right? Um, because I have to imagine that, you know, most students will, you know, if they can only do ancient or modern, they'll probably choose modern. Um, so how to continue pushing for inclusivity uh, in the world history curriculum at a time when the scope or shape of that curriculum is changing? Uh, perhaps at the disproportionate expense of non-Western histories. I'll go ahead and answer my own question. Um, I think emphasizing connections between Asian societies uh, can be one relatively efficient, elegant, uh, and I hope exciting way of teaching, especially the pre-1500 material. My main concern, however, is not uh, just that the World History AP doesn't teach enough non-Western history. It's also about how it teaches it. Uh, so I'll just ask for your indulgence with this one example um, to show you what I mean. Uh, this is an actual question from the 2017 World History AP uh, short answer section. Uh, it says, I'm sorry, this is a little bit small. It says this is a, a scroll, a, a portion of a scroll painted during the Song Dynasty around 1100. Um, so I'm talking to the microphone. The, uh, the image, um, the image uh, shows um, Guo Zi, uh, a Chinese general of the Tang meeting with Uyghur nomads on the frontiers of China. Explain two ways in which this is a continuity in China's relations with frontier peoples, and say one way that those relations changed after 1100. I won't go through all the College Board's suggested answers to this, but I'll just point out that only one of the five, uh, number four, the Chinese imperial belief in their own cultural superiority led them to depict nomadic peoples as inferior and needing to submit. That's the only one of those five that acknowledges um, that this might be a, a biased <laughs> portrayal of Uyghurs, right? Um, so I, I won't, um, again, I, I won't go through all my <laughs> feelings about this that I wrote out here, but um, I would just say a couple things. You know, the test needs to encourage students to ask questions like, would a Uyghur painter ever paint something like this? No, I've never seen an Uyghur that looks like that. Uh, I've never seen anyone that looks like that. <laughs> um, and, okay. Uh, second, um, using chronology as, a, as an analytical tool, right? Um, since Chinese history is so long, right? So many dynasties. Uh, the alleged character of each dynasty is an incredibly political issue for people in China today. And I think that a question like this should encourage students to ask, why was the Song, the later dynasty, portraying the Tang and its frontier relations in a certain way? Um, finally, uh, again, from this third section, I think better questions will also refuse uh, to echo this very important official discourse. It, it's ubiquitous in Chinese official statements. You know, China is the world's country with the longest continuous history, right? They have a little inferiority complex about Egypt. My colleague, uh, Kyle, who we'll hear from later this week, wrote an article about this, China versus Egypt, you know, the early 20th century archaeological discoveries, right? Egypt was undeniably 2,000, uh, actually thousands and thousands of years older than China in terms of the demonstrable archaeological record. So that's, where, that's kind of where this word continuous comes in. So I was very surprised to see the test using a word like continu continuity 
um, in a sort of not critical way in this context. Um, the answers I would give to the continuity question are, one, multiple Chinese dynasties portrayed foreigners and frontier peoples as barbarians. Two, multiple Chinese dynasties struggled to control the frontier territories, uh, and the territory shifted very much over time. Uh, and therefore, the need to moralize about the ideal relationship between Steppe and Song, or Wen and Wu, or etc., uh, was consistently reflected in Chinese art, regardless of what was actually happening or not happening on the frontiers. Three, every Chinese dynasty had the advantage of writing the history of the dynasty before it, uh, and most tended to politicize people and events from the previous dynasty uh, in that process. I hope any of these more critical answers would still be accepted as correct on the AP. I'm not trying to like, make us choose between um, principle and practicality here, right? Um, I think you know, you can, we, can, we, can, uh, we, can, we can teach to the test and teach beyond the test, uh, hopefully at the same time. Um, I'm making such a big deal out of this because um, you know, we're all educators, so I don't need to say this, but there, there's an intimate relationship between what we don't know enough about and um, what injustices we're willing to tolerate, right? Look at the, look at this photo, right? Look, this, this photo, and look at this painting. Um, in light of that, do that one more time. This, this photo <laughs> and this painting. Um, Uyghurs and the Chinese state, right? Uh, or the depiction thereof. Right? Um, in light of this, I would, I would just say, in one way or another, we have to teach more about China. We have to teach more about China. Uh, then, then the question is, how do you teach it? So uh, that's where Islam and Muslims can come in. Uh, why? Because the history of Islam and Muslims in China is not just a reminder that China is diverse, or just a reminder that Asia was interconnected. It does show those things pretty vividly. Um, but more importantly, the history of Islam and Muslims in China is a reminder that nation states are not the same as whatever came before them, whether it's an empire or a diaspora or, or, or whatever. Um, this history is a reminder that the homogenous nation state, the homogenous, homogenous ethnic group, the minority, the minority, the mi majority, the minority, uh, these are all at best convenient myths. Um, I found that this is a challenging, a challenging idea to get across to students. I mean, maybe your students are light years ahead of mine, or maybe I'm just not saying it right, but uh, it, it's a very important idea, anyway, to get across to students. Nation states are, are never the same as what became what came before them. Um, so as we walk through uh, this history together, I think um, it'll be clear not only that the identities of Muslims in China changed over time, uh, but also that the meanings of China itself and the Islamic world itself were changing just as profoundly over the same span of time. Uh, and talking about Chinese Muslims can be a microcosmic and efficient way of connecting and comparing those much larger transformations. This, I just included these in case we wanted to refer to them, but you can see the, the territorial changes. Long story short, you can see the territorial changes um, of the various empires that occupy China. Okay, um, I'll try to be a more compact with the aspects of this that overlap with what we've already heard. Anyway, the first thing that needs to be said about Chinese Muslims is um, their origin myths and uh, early formations of communities, plural. Uh, origin myths, these have to do sometimes with imaginary exchanges between the Tang Emperor and the Prophet Muhammad. Um, there are different versions of that story. Sometimes a Muslim appears to the, em the Tang Emperor in a dream. Sometimes they send emissaries. Uh, the story of uh, Sa'd and Abu'l Qas uh, that, uh, that we've heard about is, uh, is a popular one. Um, the important thing about most of these stories, though, is that they didn't appear until the Ming, six or seven hundred years after Muslims first appeared in China. And we'll talk later about why. That is. Um, for now, in these early days, the 8th century, China was seen as the farthest uh, eastern frontier uh, in the classic Islamic worldview. Uh, it was even farther away than the region known to the Romans as Transoxiana and to the Arabs as Mawara and or the lands beyond the river Oxus. Um, the Arab general, Qutayb ibn Muslim, uh, reached, uh, as we heard earlier, the frontiers, the western frontiers of the Tang in the early 8th century. 
And after that, we have, uh, after the Abbasid Caliphate is in place, Arab armies meet a Tom garrison at the Battle of Talas in 751. Uh, that's um, this battle has both a real and a semi-mythical status as the beginning of interaction between the two civilizations. Um, the most important result of it at the time was that the Tang retreated from their, their forays into Central Asia, uh, and Transoxiana became part of the Abbasid realms. At that same time, or soon thereafter, uh, Arab and Persian merchants also began arriving by sea in southeastern China, you see from uh, the graves at Guangzhou and Quanzhou. Um, as your, uh, actually there was a question about this before, you're probably already sensing there's a problem of attestation here. Uh, the question of origins is extremely important both for our scholarly knowledge and also for the self-knowledge of Chinese Muslims themselves. But a lot of it, by definition, is extremely difficult to know. Uh, so what do we know? We have first some, some physical and archaeological evidence. Uh, there would be a lot more of it if it weren't for the Cultural Revolution. Uh, as well as the development boom that followed it. In any case, you know, the, the great mosque of Xi'an, uh, in Tang times known, known as Chang'an, uh, the eastern terminus of the Overland Silk Road, capital of the Tang, one of the largest cities in the world at the time, uh, over one million people. The establishment of a mosque inside the walls of Chang'an was a significant event and spoke to the creation of a more stable community, not just soldiers or, or, or merchants going back and forth, but, uh, but a, a settled Muslim community in China. You also have um, the Huaishang Mosque in, uh, in Guangzhou. That, uh, I, I don't have an image, but you saw it uh, in the earlier presentation. And finally, you have the tombs uh, in uh, Guangzhou and Quanzhou that have uh, multilingual inscriptions. Second, there are also some written sources, Chinese dynastic records, no tribute from Muslim countries beginning during the Tang. Um, also, there are some Arabic travel accounts, uh, some, some famous ones. Um, Hassan ibn Nizid Abu Zayd al-Sirafi, uh, claiming to be based on an earlier work by uh, Suleiman al I, I can give you these names if you want, Sorry, they're not all up there. Um, Akbar al-Sin the, the uh, Chronicles of China and India from around 850. Um, this, that work shows, there's a sense that the journey from all the way from the Persian Gulf to China was both extraordinary and relatively commonplace. Uh, and the fact that there are some Muslims in China, even at that early point, is taken for granted in, in that work. Um, also, Ibn Khodadba, uh, the Persian bureaucrat, uh, wrote in Arabic the Kitab al-Masalik al the Book of Roads and Kingdoms. Um, also, the histories of al-Tabari and al-Mas'udi, the, they, they also rely on these accounts. So there's some written accounts in Arabic. Once in a while, you also have more detailed attestations appearing in Chinese sources. Uh, for example, the Tang histories identify somebody named Li Yansheng uh, as an, an Arab, Da Shi Wor. A Da Shi is the Tang era, a Chinese term for, for an Arab. Um, they, they think it may come from the Arabic word Teja for merchant, but they're not sure. Um, this guy, Li Yanchang, was appointed uh, to an official position at the palace after taking the civil serv service exam and uh, getting the highest marks. <clears throat> uh, some native-born Chinese asked, uh, you know, why appoint a barbarian when you can appoint um, a Huaren or a Chinese person? Mm -hmm. uh, the supporters of Li said, the governor recommended this man for his abilities without regard to his origins. If one speaks in terms of geography, there are Hua and there are barbarians. But if one speaks in terms of education, there can be no such difference. Uh, this story was, again, recorded later. right? So Chinese Muslims in later periods have an interest in mobilizing ideas and stories like that according to the politics of later times also. So I, want, I wanted to say that. but. Um, at the same time, as much as Muslims in China benefited from learning Chinese language and culture and rising in China's social and political systems, at the same time, Muslims in China also remained connected to Muslims elsewhere uh, consistently. Uh, this helped their community to grow, uh, differentiated them from the Nestorian Christians, the Jews of Kaifeng, uh, or the old Buddhist communities of, of Quanzhou. Um, 
all of which were relatively more isolated and uh, numerically stable or gradually shrinking. Uh, Trenjo, by contrast, had so many Arabs and Persians uh, by the, the Song era that it was also given an Arabic name, Zaytun, uh, meaning olive. Merchants came here from around the Indian Ocean, uh, which also, which brings me to the next point. The rise of the Xixia Kingdom near the terminus of the old overland Silk Road prompted uh, overland trade to be directed further south around the year 1000, uh, but also encouraged sorry a greater volume of it to move by sea. Um, so yeah, we heard about this. Uh, uh, from Harrison also. Um, it was not unusual for there to be Muslims from all over Asia living uh, in several parts of China. Um, what happened was, so the, the Muslim merchants uh, would live and operate especially in Canton, uh, Guangzhou, they called it Hanfu, uh, Quanzhou, they called it Zetun, also Hangzhou, and Yangzhou is not on there. Uh, anyway, south, the southeastern port cities and also along the Grand Canal and Yangtze, the greater Yangtze Delta. Um, but they also remain connected to this vast system around the Indian Ocean. Srivijaya, Banda, the Spice Islands, Bengal, Malabar, Hormuz, Hanruma, Aden, uh, Zanzibar, Cairo, um, uh, yeah, all these places. Seaborne trade peaked in the early Song when Chinese sources recorded 56 tribute missions uh, from Southeast Asia, South Asia, and Middle East in the first three imperial reigns alone. Um, the sea routes, as Harrison mentioned, were um, generally less precarious than the overland routes. Uh, that said, Muslim presence didn't go always unchallenged in the port cities. Um, Harrison mentioned the, uh, the Huangchao Rebellion. Uh, 879, uh, where uh, tens of thousands uh, of foreign merchants, many of the Muslims, were, were killed. <clears throat> uh, those events are actually reported in the histories of uh, Serafi and uh, Masoudi. So, um, yeah, what, what products uh, dominated the maritime exchange and how do we know? Um, uh, the additional ones that I want to mention are um, Aromatics, spices, and uh, materia medica. Um, frankincense, myrrh, nutmeg, cloves, costus, sandalwood, benzoin, and so on. Uh, frankincense, uh, in particular, comes from southern Arabia. Uh, that was used at the Chinese imperial court uh, in Song times. The state had a monopoly on some items. Uh, <clears throat> the frankincense was one of them. Uh, Muslim merchants also sent products from Eastern Asia. Uh, westward, such as uh, Tibetan musk, attested in Arabic sources. So the, uh, part of the evidence for this is pharmacopias written in Chinese. Uh, one example of this is uh, Li Shun, you see it on the left here. Um, lived in the 9th century, a scholar, merchant, and pharmacist whose ancestors uh, had migrated from, uh, from Persia to Sichuan uh, sometime during the Tang. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so Li had a, you know, his studies, but also his family's aromatic business. Uh, and uh, the entries in his pharmacopoeia, the uh, Hayao Ban Cao, uh, or a, a miscellany of maritime material medica, uh, include information on the etymology, the origins, the forms, and the uses of many, many of about 140 materials. The, plur the plurality of which came from Southeast Asia, and many of which had not been recorded in earlier Chinese works. This original text was lost, but um, seminal Chinese pharmacopias uh, from later periods um, contain several of the materials that, uh, that Li cataloged. Um, so you see, some of the products are actually nativized before the Muslims themselves are I won't get into this, but um, the richness of the trade in aromatics and materia medica led to the formation of many long-standing Muslim pharmacies in all parts of China. Pharmacy is a, is a prominent industry throughout the Islamic world, and this, the same is actually true in China. Uh, this is true across several dynasties and into the 20th century. <clears throat> Uh, 
besides spices, aromatics, and materia medica, we also, of course, have bronzes and porcelain. Uh, traded on maritime routes because you, you don't want to feed an animal to drag something that heavy over, over land, of course. Um, <clears throat> so there's an interesting story about this. Uh, the, um, these quintessentially Chinese blue and white uh, uh, porcelains, there's a great article about this. Um, those were originally made only for export. To Persia and Arab lands. Uh, originally, for the domestic market, the the, the Jingdezhen kilns would produce only greens and uh, browns and you know monochromatic stuff. Uh, they called the blue in that Hui Weiqing, meaning Muslim blue. Um, by the Ming, they decided this stuff actually looks pretty nice, so we gotta keep it for ourselves. Um, <laughs> but they also produced, as you see here, they also produced. Uh, a lot of those porcelains with Arabic script on them. Uh, the, the Chinese people at the kilns didn't know what they were writing, or maybe they had a Muslim to help them, but probably didn't know what they were writing, uh, but would just produce it and then they would sell it. <clears throat> of course, also, texts. Uh, here you have a, a, a copy of the, uh, sorry, the, the, the letter of the Khairat. Uh, which is a, um, a Sufi text from Morocco from the 15th century, spread to all regions of North Africa, uh, Middle East, Asia, Southeast Asia, and China. This one is interesting because um, it's, it was found in Xinjiang in the 18th century, but it's written in the, the Sini script, uh, or the, the, the Chinese Muslim style of Arabic script. Um, you also, of course, have Qurans moving back and forth, but uh, uh, not always as much as you might think. Um, in any case, the maritime exchange goes on for, for, for generations. <clears throat> Next, the unprecedented Mongol integration of Asia that uh, we've also heard about. Um, there's a special relationship, as uh, Harrison mentioned, between Kublai Khan, and, uh, who became leader of the UN Mongol dynasty, and Hulagu, who was the, 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 the Mongol controlling. Um, Persia. Hulagu uh, supported Kublai's claim to the, the throne of the UN uh, at the Mongol succession meeting in 1259. So then they, had, they had a good relationship uh, going forward from then. Uh, so this facilitated all kinds of political and cultural exchange between those two in particular. Uh, also, the Mongols have conquered Baghdad. There's an enormous transfer of personnel, soldiers, administrators, scientists, astronomers, everything from Baghdad from the former Abbasid territories to Beijing, or Khanbalik, as it was called. Um, at this time, Muslims occupied positions above the Han, second only to the Mongols. Um, Marco Polo was also considered one of these foreign advisors, but most of them were Muslim. Um, we also have military figures. Um, a guy named Sayyid Ajal Shamsuddin Omar al Bukhari from, from, from Bukhara. Uh, a Muslim um, conquered the province of Yunnan and governed it on behalf of the Mongols. This was not this province was not part of China before. You also have um, Muslim a third of all um, maritime uh, port directors, uh, uh, directors of, of, of maritime trade under the Mongols were Muslim. Um, <clears throat> also, scientists and polymaths and astronomers. Uh, um, uh, Physicians, um, engineers, uh, a, a device called the Hui Hui Pao was a, a, a trebuchet of Persian origin uh, that the Mongols used to lay siege to southern Song cities when they're um, conquering the southern Song. The Mongol era also brings new controversies over loyalty. This is a particular advisor, a story of a particular advisor to um, Kublai Khan named Ahmed uh, that. Um, Marco Polo had certain things, critical things to say about uh, 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 another advisor, Jamal ad Din had more, uh, um, uh, sorry, Rashid ad Din had, had uh, more favorable things to say about. But there's this question of are Muslims loyal, are they reliable, will they help the state uh, also going on in um, Mongol times. Um, I won't get
get into all of this, but uh, just a very important, of course, uh, attestation of Muslim presence in China in the Mongol era comes from Ibn Battuta, uh, sort of the epitome of a peripatetic pre-modern Muslim. Um, he attests to the presence of Muslims in China, uh, but he also has mixed impressions of the place overall. Uh, it's important that he notes that Muslims are not, uh, they still live in separate quarters, they still maintain their own languages, their own customs, um, etc. They, they live together but separately uh, in China. <coughs> the Mongol to Ming transition uh, has been called one the most important transition in uh, Chinese Islamic history uh, because the Ming was the first self-consciously Chinese dynasty. Before the Ming, as we've seen, the borders remained very open. Uh, during the Ming, they were closed. So Muslim merchants, whether they, uh, you know, whatever their business was, would have to choose an affiliation and a location, whether they wanted to stay, basically stay in China or stay outside. Um, the Han centrism of the new dynasty is also visible in the move of the capital to Nanjing, uh, even though it was it was moved back to Beijing after the first reign period. Uh, the Han centrism and the closure of the borders in the Ming was also reflected in an unprecedented shift in the life ways of Muslims in China. Uh, in the words of one historian, uh, the Ming is when the Muslims in China became Chinese Muslims. Uh, as early as the Song. Dynastic records contain funny categories like the Tu Sheng Fan Ke, which is a, a means a native born foreigner, so funny phrase, um, and similar phrases. Uh, people who fell into that category were allowed to intermarry, uh, and purchase land for mosques and cemeteries. Uh, they could also become officials, um, but they still lived separately. So the Ming changed all that. The Ming uh, pursued two diametrically opposed policies in sequence toward Muslims, uh, both of which reveal, again, the Han centrism of the dynasty. Um, they didn't ban Islam outright, uh, like other foreign religions, um, but uh, they were clearly anxious about Muslim power. So at first they tried to homogenize through exclusion. They tried to say, no intermarriage, <coughs> no changing your surnames to Chinese surnames, uh, no living together, etc. Uh, n no constructing mosques. Soon they realized that homogeneity would be better achieved through assimilation than exclusion. Uh, so they started, the Ming started encouraging intermarriage between Muslims and Chinese, started encouraging Muslims to take Chinese surnames, Mahmud, Muhammad, change to Ma. Um, things like Khaled or Hamid or, or, or uh, etc. being Ha. Anything with uh, a deen like Jamal ad deen or Shams ad deen or, or Rashid ad deen became the surname Ding, uh, and so on. Um, and these remain common Chinese Muslim surnames uh, to this day. Um, the Ming also sponsored the construction of mosques as long as they adhered to Chinese architectural styles. Um, Xi Jinping's government also actually enacted a similar set of architectural restrictions uh, last year. Um, you can't have anything with minarets or anything that looks Arab, whatever that means. Um, finally, in the Ming, Arabic and Persian also disappeared as the languages of everyday life. Uh, traditional Muslim dress disappeared or changed. Um, separate Muslim quarters of cities, to an extent, uh, changed, diminished. Uh, so the main thing left was the Islamic belief system itself. fitting that we should uh, reference the Jesuits here. Um, Matteo Ricci, uh, Jesuit in China, um, observed some of these changes happening uh, to the Muslims in China when he was there uh, in, in the 16th century. Um, they are, uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're being treated as native Chinese. They're also being inc increasingly regarded as loyal uh, to, uh, to a state. Um, again, also the uh, Jungha voyages. Um, again, th this is regarded, you, you'll see questions about this on the World History AP, as you know. Uh, so this is, you know, regarded as a, an episode of world historical significance. But what is that significance? Um, we, we know that the fleet was, of course, very impressive. 
Um, uh, we know a lot about um, Jungla's skill as a navigator, um, but uh, sometimes the, the historians uh, haven't fully addressed why it's important that Jungla was a Muslim. Um, so I, I, I just I also want to connect the dots a little bit here. Zheng He was a Muslim born in the province of Yunnan uh, under the name Ma He and was the fifth or sixth generation descendant of the aforementioned Sayyid Ajal Shamsuddin of Bukhara, the Muslim who conquered Yunnan for the Mongols. Zheng He's family were local Muslim elites in Yunnan and his father was a Mongol loyalist at the time of the Ming takeover. <clears throat> uh, the Ming killed his family and captured Zheng He, castrated him as a child. Uh, and brought him to the palace in Beijing. Um, so, uh, you know, as common as castration was uh, during most Chinese dynasties in situations like this, uh, I think in this case we have to note that this was also specifically uprooting local Muslim elites in a recently annexed frontier province, uh, removing their ability to self-perpetuate and co-opting them through official patronage. Uh, and Zheng He's voyages, in a way, represent, represented the completion of that process. Uh, you know, the scion of the former uh, Muslim Mongol loyalists were now acting at the behest of the new Ming conquerors uh, to project Chinese power toward Muslims abroad and also, uh, no doubt, to make a statement to Muslims at home. Um, by the next couple of centuries, you start to, you, this is the, after 700 years of having Muslims in China, this is the first time Chinese Muslims are writing and speaking. The first extant example we have of Chinese Muslims speaking and writing for themselves as Chinese Muslims. Um, this tradition is called the Han Kitab, this is the, or the Chinese Islamic canon. This is the Chinese word for Chinese plus the uh, Arabic word for book. Um, it's also known as Hui Ru, uh, or the Islamo-Confucian tradition. Um, this is where Chinese Muslim elites uh, serving as literati and writing in Chinese um, would explain Islamic doctrines and practices and histories uh, in a Confucian idiom. Um, uh, as much as this has been treated as a, a remarkable, I'm going to keep being cynical here, um, <laughs> as much as this is treated as a remarkable moment of cultural synthesis, I think the timing also speaks to the pressures, the political pressures that Chinese Muslims were feeling. Right. Uh, the pressure due to the closures of the borders, uh, the pressures due to the Han centrism of the Ming, um, even though the Qing is not Han, of course, um, but, uh, but the Qing is expansionist. They're expanding into Muslim territories on the western frontiers. Um, and they are, you know, the, the Qing is, is, on the whole, less friendly toward Muslims than the last foreign dynasty, the Mongols. <laughs> so here, I, we don't have to. Uh, you can read this for yourself, but um, uh, quotations like this um, capture the general, the general spirit of um, the Han Kitab tradition, which is, um, again, mobilizing the earlier past, uh, or certain aspects of the earlier past, to say that Chinese Muslims belong in China, and they're loyal to China, they have a special relationship with uh, the Chinese state, Chinese society. Location is also important. The Han Kitab authors lived in the eastern Chinese cities. They did not come from uh, the, west, the northwestern territories. Um, <clears throat> okay. uh, we're doing about a century per minute here. Um, the 17th and 18th centuries saw new Sufi groups forming in northwest China. This is connected to the general Sufi revival. Uh, happening across Asia at that time. So you know, Ottoman and Indian and Yemeni and Central Asian influences um, coming in. Uh, leading sheikhs of what became the two main Sufi orders in Northwest China among Chinese-speaking Muslims, um, both traveled to Mecca and other places uh, in the mid-18th century. By this point, due to the closure of the borders, that was very rare. You'd have like one extremely talented person per generation, per locale, leaving China for that kind of journey. Compared to the Mongol era before, everyone's moving back and forth 
uh, constant. Um, these two main groups, uh, Sufi groups, end up disagreeing about certain aspects of Islamic ritual, and um, I'm sure there were some material factors as well uh, uh, pushing them to, to conflict. Um, they disagree over over the zikr, the, the whether um, uh, remembrance of God should be vocal or silent, uh, and other other ritual aspects. Um, the thing is, uh, this is when the Qing is moving into northwestern China. Uh, they too, like the Ming, close, keep the borders closed. They also set up; they have to set up a legal regime. Um, uh, this legal regime often involves separate treatment for Muslims. Uh, so the Qing, the Qing end up ruling and uh, not in the sense of governing, but uh, uh, passing legal decisions on questions of Muslim ritual in these newly conquered territories. So it, get, it gets complicated. Um, everything boils up in the 19th century. You have rebellions uh, in the Northwest, in Xinjiang, and in Yunnan uh, of Muslims against the Qing. This is, in a sense, part of the general weakening of the Qing Empire in the 19th century. This is co coincides with the Taiping Rebellion. But it's also a part of the Muslim reaction against the Qing incursions into those territories. Zhuo Zongtang uh, uh, and his uh, Han army from Hunan were sent to pacify uh, the Northwest and reconquer Xinjiang for the Qing after a, a heated debate in Beijing about whether they, they should just focus on the, the problems with the Westerners and the treaty ports or, or, or also try to reconquer uh, this, this territory out West. <clears throat> Zhuo Zongtang it took him a very long time. Uh, he killed or forcibly relocated thousands of Muslims. Now he's known uh, more readily for uh, General Zhou's chicken uh, than for um, this uh, pretty brutal legacy. Um, in any case, the memory of these 19th century uprisings hangs over the Chinese Muslims into the 20th century when the Republic is established. And they feel that they need to prove again that their community belongs in China, it's peaceful, it won't rebel again. Uh, it has a special relationship with the state. Again. So, the, the fundamental dualism of the modern era uh, for Chinese Muslims, uh, let me start with that. The new communication technologies, right, combined with the tremendous uh, political, intellectual, and cultural ferment uh, across the Islamic world at this time allowed Chinese Muslims unprecedented opportunities to connect, uh, or they would say reconnect, with Muslims outside China. Right? Um, but at the same time, Chinese nationalism is putting unprecedented pressure on them, again, to demonstrate belonging and loyalty to China. Chinese Muslims no, no longer have the luxury of abstraction that they had with the the Han Kitab, where they can just say, oh, Islam and Confucianism are, are similar, they're, they're philosophically equivalent, they're separate, separate but equal, right? Uh, they, they, can't, they can't make that kind of argument anymore. Um, in a modern nation state, they have to somehow subordinate Muslimness politically to Chineseness. Um, in other words, they have to answer the question, uh, who are you, <laughs> um, uh, in, in a totally new way. Uh, just to give you some of the uh, events here, the earliest re record we have of a Chinese Muslim going on the Hajj uh, to Mecca in the modern times is um, Mada Xin, from, also from Yunnan, in the 1840s. Um, <clears throat> I have some, yes, images from his travel log here. An accurate portrayal of the, the Kaaba uh, at Mecca and a description of uh, I guess you have to take my word for it. A description of um, of Cairo uh, in both Chinese and Arabic. When Muslims go abroad, so so they Chinese Muslims go abroad in increasing numbers as steam travel improves, right? So from the 1890s to the early 1930s, they're going at the level of dozens or even hundreds per year, whereas before the 19th century, they're going as I said, one, maybe one per generation. Um, when they go abroad, they find 
what we call the blanket term Islamic modernism, right? They learn about Al Afghani and Muhammad Abdu in, in Egypt. They meet eventually Rashid Rida. They meet Shakib Arslan. They meet Muhammad al Khatib. They meet Hassan al Banna, founder of the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood. Um, these, these are all publishers and activists and journalists and Islamic thinkers uh, in the Middle East. Um, they read Rashid Rida's Al Manar, the most prominent uh, Islamic modernist publication. Um, and they read nearly uh, every other major uh, Islamic modernist, or at least at least collect, if they can't read it, they, they collect it. Um, Islamic modernist periodicals from all corners of Asia, um, which I, I found what some of these were. Um, so they also, like, those, like their counterparts in the Middle East and elsewhere, they increasingly come to stress, as Islamic modernists, both reason and revival in Islam. Right? They also stress education reform, they stress women's rights, they stress science and democracy, they stress Islam's compatibility with all these things. Um, and Chinese Muslims are, are greatly influenced by these ideas uh, coming in from elsewhere. Uh, and there's a certain consonance between some of those ideas and the ideas of reform-minded non-Muslim Chinese at this time as well, the early 20th century. With this, you also have a question of Arabization. Is Chinese Islam becoming more Arabized in the early 20th century? The answer is both yes and no. <laughs> um, the older Turkic and Persian influences do retreat, and there is a um, normative prioritization on the part of Chinese Muslims uh, saying uh, Arabs are the truest, the earliest and the truest Muslims. We should focus more on learning Arabic. We should focus more on the role of Arabs in Islamic history, um, etc. But that priority, as you can see from where they were getting, they, they got the most, the greatest number and uh, the earliest periodicals from Southeast Asia, not from the Middle East. Uh, so these priorities of normative um, Arabization are actually coming from Muslim regions other than the Arab Middle East. Then you have the issue of what's going on with China. Um, the empire to nation transition in China, much like uh, an Ottoman or Austro-Hungarian empires, it has certain consequences. Right? Han ethnocentrism returns. Uh, Sun Yat-sen and others debate what the place of minorities should be in the new nation state. Um, but now that the Manchus are gone, uh, it's widely accepted that the country is essentially Han, and then there are others in subordinate positions. The second feature of the empire to nation transition, as with almost everywhere else in the world, is that print media explodes, right? And public conscious mass politics expands tremendously. So Chinese Muslims are forced, again, to articulate explicitly for the very first time, uh, or, or to an un unprecedented extent, what their religion is and what their identity is, um, more so than ever before. Uh, but they're doing so, sorry, yeah, they're doing so in a way that's still connected to what's happening in the Middle East, South Asia, Southeast Asia. Um, so one thing they do is they start forming their own journals, which are mostly published in Chinese, so that non-Muslim Chinese can also read them uh, and hopefully understand. <clears throat> uh, but a lot of what, what's in these journals is um, translated from, I should have put some images up though, I'm sorry. Um, actually, maybe I have. Yes, here you see the, the main uh, Chinese Muslim journal from this period. You see they're, they're using Arabic, that they are influenced by um, publications in uh, the Middle East, um, but it's very much, very much for a Chinese audience. Um, sorry, again, location matters, right? Look at the dominance of Beijing and Shanghai in this list. So the Muslim, Chinese Muslim periodicals 
are not being published where the greatest numbers of Muslims are. They're being published where the most powerful Muslims are, and also where the centers of, of state power are, right? and where the infrastructure is the most developed, the eastern cities. Um, Chinese Muslim leaders start arguing that um, they need to unify Chinese Islam and improve its educational system. That, that sounds nice, but actually what they're saying is they need to reform um, the Sufis of the Northwest because they are allegedly uh, irrational and uh, you know, anti-modern and superstitious, uh, etc. Um, the people making that argument are the intellectual and in some cases biological descendants of the Han Kitab authors. They live in the eastern Chinese cities and they have a vested interest in being more integrationist than uh, Muslims uh, on the frontiers, arguably. Um, so they say, uh, yeah, they want to tell the Muslims on the frontiers uh, that, uh, you know, we need more, not less dialogue with Han culture, Confucian culture. Um, <clears throat> At the same time, they also say we need to bring frontier Muslims Islam in line with the spirit of the times, uh, which by that they mean um, make it more rational and also more Arabized. So here you have um, just a catalog of Arabic language books that uh, was collected in Shanghai by some of the people I'm talking about. Um, and it, it adheres to the uh, standard division of the Islamic sciences uh, that was being taught in Egypt. Um, this was actually totally new to Chinese Muslims uh, in their, their madrasa curricula in the 20th century. Before this, they were using a relatively eclectic collection of books, uh, mostly of Turkic and Persian influence. So there's a huge, uh, there is a huge new emphasis on Arabic and Arabness in their curricula. Uh, and they associate this with, with modernity, with being modern Muslims. Um, very importantly, Chinese Muslim elites from the eastern cities are also extremely involved in the Guomindang government. Okay? Um, there are warlords who are allied to the Republican government. Um, there's something called the Mongolian Tibetan Affairs Commission, which for a time uh, which is a frontier government, Guomindan frontier governance organ based on a Qing predecessor. Uh, certain important Muslims are very involved with that. Um, Muslims help the government produce propaganda in Arabic and Uyghur uh, to be distributed on the frontiers. Uh, Muslims help the Guomindan intervene in conflicts in Tibet uh, and also when the East Turkestan Republic declares independence. Muslims, Chinese Muslims allied to the Guomindang are sent to crush the East Turkestan Republic. Um, so Chinese Muslim elites become indispensable uh, to Guomindang nation building. Long story short, they become indispensable to Guomindang nation building uh, by the 1930s. At the same time, they're, they're try again, they're trying to make all this work, right? They're trying to balance the desire to be more connected to Muslims elsewhere with the desire to preserve their, their status and their security in China, right? Um, so one of the ways they do this, they send a bunch of student delegations to Egypt, um, sponsored by the Guomindang government and the Egyptian monarchy. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's basically to train the purpose of this from the view of the Chinese Muslim elites is, is not just to produce translations or to engage culturally, it's to train people who will then be able to be sent out to the frontiers to teach modern correct Islam to the frontier Muslims. Modern correct Islam meaning pro-Chinese uh, government <laughs> Islam. The other uh, signature achievement of um, this period is uh, Chinese Muslim diplomacy during the war with Japan. Um, and. Uh, yeah, so Muslims would go out to the Middle East and South Asia and Southeast Asia trying to convince neutral countries to try to explain to them China's uh, cause in the war with Japan, trying to get them to side against Japan. Um, it didn't totally work. There were a lot of Chinese Muslims living in Japanese-occupied territory. They also got sent abroad for probably similar purposes. 
two groups actually, in one case, meet up in Mecca, and they actually know each other already, but they're, they're, they've found themselves on opposite sides uh, of this conflict. There are some good things I can give you to read about that interesting episode. Um, I'll try to wrap up pretty quickly. Uh, the last, last thing I want to talk about before wrapping up is ethnicization uh, and marginalization from uh, uh, in the most recent times. So the CCP, when they, when they become ensconced in Yan'an, also have contact with Muslims. Uh, it's a largely Muslim area that they're um, uh, operating from in Shanxi in the, in the 30s. Um, try to compress this. Um, the ideas of minor limited minority autonomy that the CCP later applies to the entire country are originally developed in this period in Yan'an, Shanxi, where uh, the communists are interacting with local Muslims. Um, after 49, after the PRC uh, is founded, um, Muslims are, when you look at the sources, Muslims are clearly anxious about what the new regime is going to mean. But for about 10 years, uh, you have the PRC adopting some of the same uh, tactics of, 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 of using Muslims for certain political purposes uh, that the Republic did. So Zhou Enlai, when he goes to the Bandung conference, the first Afro-Asian conference in uh, April 1955, brings one of these prominent Chinese Muslim elite imams uh, with him um, to show Nasser, to show everyone that uh, China is, is still friendly toward Muslims. I, I don't know if Zhou realized that Nasser had put the Muslim Brotherhood in jail in Egypt uh, the year before that. Um, in any case, it's really starting in the late 50s that under the anti-rightist campaign, the Chinese Muslims are, are more persecuted. Uh, during the Cultural Revolution, um, this increases. The worship, uh, uh, travel abroad, pilgrimage, uh, even certain foods are prohibited from Chinese Muslims. Um, in the 80s, with the opening up, um, Chinese Muslims are able to go on pilgrimage again uh, and go abroad for study again, but it's in a highly, even more highly scripted and, and, and monitored manner than before. Um, uh, so, I'll wrap up. My arguments uh, can be summed up in a single sentence. The history of Islam and Muslims in China is not the backstory to the One Belt, One Road. It is the story of many belts, many roads. Uh, it cannot be, cannot be forced into any single box, whether that box is the box of the Chinese state or the box of um, even what, what some powerful Chinese Muslims might say themselves. Um, I think we can... Last thing I want to say, um, again, back to why should we teach this. Uh, we're living once again in a time of nationalism, authoritarianism, and Islamophobia. This is true here in China and elsewhere. Um, you can use, so in light of that, you can use the history of Islam and Muslims in China as a vivid illustration of the expansiveness and complexity of the Islamic world um, and of Islam's complex and long-standing engagement with um, various non-Muslim societies. You can use it to show that there's no such thing as civilizations clashing. Um, Huntington actually talked about something he called Islamo-Confucian civilization um, being a threat. He probably didn't realize that there was actually something called the Han Kitab, which also called itself Islamo-Confucian civilization, um, but was completely different, of course, from what he was talking about. Um, you can also use this to, not to undo, but to qualify and historicize the idea of Islam being an Arab-centric uh, phenomenon. Okay, showing that civilizations don't, don't clash is necessary but not sufficient, right? Because um, there's a way in which that argument for synthesis and acculturation plays into uh, certain official narratives uh, coming from, from China. Um, which is, again, that over time, all non-Chinese peoples experienced a peaceful, harmonious, and inexorable process of scientization. Um, as much as Chinese Muslims might seem like the best example of that, um, 
they are also, I think, the most important exception to that because we've seen that in every single period, uh, they never fully lost connections, their connections to the Islamic world outside China. Finally, most importantly, you can use the history of Islam and Muslims in China in a very powerful way to deconstruct primordialist and monolithic notions of ethnicity and the nation state, uh, Chinese or otherwise, and uh, teach people that China is not just one group uh, of people with a, you know, where everybody agrees on what it is. And uh, despite being very old, uh, in some ways it's actually quite similar to places like the United States or other, uh, other modern nation states. It's, uh, that is, it is large, it's complicated, it's a majoritarian society uh, that has yet to come to terms with the fact of its diversity. Thank you. Talk, probably lots of questions. Harrison? Sure. Um, thank you very much for the talk, John. Uh, could you expand a little bit about when you were talking about the period of Islamic modernism and the, you know, the, the spread of these ideas from Jamal al and Al-Fani and Abdul and the and the rest? Is the language of transmission in Arabic or in Mandarin? And then what is the effect of the language of choice towards like, ideas of print capitalism and identity construction during this period? That's a great question. Yeah, and um, yeah, it, it, uh, yeah, it, it's a complicated but fascinating process. Um, so, when steam travel becomes um, when steam travel becomes possible uh, or more more practicable, prominent Chinese Muslim imams start going abroad, but they they, they go to different places. They first go to Cairo and Istanbul. Um, but then as more and more go abroad and um, as uh, you know, both steam travel and print media uh, become um, more, exchanges become more intense, they actually start getting influences. <laughs> Again, I influences not just from the Arab Middle East first, but from all over the place. Um, and uh, this creates a problem. There's also a practical problem because um, the, the language of transmission often was not, not Arabic or Chinese, but English, right? Because they, they didn't, um, you know, South Asia and Southeast Asia, there are a lot of English-speaking Muslims there. They're geographically more proximate to China. Uh, they can get a lot of those, as you can see from this, get a lot more of the Muslim writings from India uh, and, and Southeast Asia. This makes a problem, though, for the ones who decide that they need to pursue a more um, orthodox is a tricky word, but a more orthodox, a more uh, middle of the road, um, uh, you know, take on, on modern Islam. So uh, they're, they're actually collecting in the 20s a lot of works by the Indian Ahmadiyya movement, which is uh, considered at the time to be, uh, by, by many to be hetero completely heterodox. Um, and they're completing, they're co collecting those materials in English. Um, then this one guy who happens to be a Chinese Muslim studying in Lucknow, uh, in India, um, figures out that this is going on, that the people in Beijing are, his co-religionists in Beijing are collecting Ahmadiyya works, and he writes to them because Lucknow is a completely Arab-centric, you know, they, they only read stuff from Cairo and Mecca. Um, you know, and, and they're very um, uh, preoccupied with or orthodoxy. Uh, he writes to them saying, <laughs> you know, no more of this. You have to read only things that are produced in Cairo and Mecca and, and, and uh, um, places like that. So there's a very contingent um, turn toward Arabization by the, only by the 1930s, actually, uh, as a result of this, this, as you said, this, you know, exchanges of steam and print. Um, uh, it starts out going one way, and then in the middle it goes all these different ways, and then uh, contingently turns back toward emphasizing Arabic and Arabs. It's a wonderful question. Thank you. Hi. So it's really rare for me to see someone that's studying Chinese and Arabic. So. 
fake from home, whatever language you want to use. <laughs> but um, <Fine. laughs> I really hope that we can see this kind of um, lesson plan showing up more in American curriculums, whether it's in middle school, high school, or university. I just graduated from university, and I know Ted's team is still studying, and it's rare for us to see this kind of like cross-cultural perspective, and especially non-Eurocentric perspective. Um, but I know in China it's possibly even more difficult because there's such a lack of freedom of information. What you're not even, I mean, I think in the US sometimes the problem is that information is out there, but we don't go and seek it, we don't know where to start. But in China, even if the information is put in front of you, you may not be able to say it. So what do you think the solution is for increasing Chinese people's understanding of, I mean, a section of their own citizens? Um, yeah, I think if you're, if you're in China and you know Chinese, um, you could, I, thank you first of all, this, this is extremely important. Um, it depends who you're talking to, right, how, how open they're going to be. I mean, um, you know, there, there are a lot of Chinese students who come to study in the United States. Um, you know, whether it's that or whether it's in China, there, there are varying degrees of, of, as you said, openness to finding the information, right? So if you are engaging with people who are open to finding the information, it's wonderful, right? Um, if it's, you know, if, if, if they have some preconceived uh, notions that China is a certain thing and is not another thing, then it can be uh, more tricky. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, that's on the everyday, right? Like uh, people to people uh, level, but, um, but the, the state level is a different issue. That, that, um, Right now, there are certain issues that are always automatically more sensitive. The, the three T's, um, Tibet, Tiananmen, uh, Taiwan, and now, now X for Xinjiang, right? Those, those are the four issues that will definitely, you know, um, uh, result in, you know, uh, uh, sort of automatic flagging, right? Um, with Chinese Muslims, partly because of well, the, the whole history that, uh, you know, of, of what Chinese Muslims are and have been, um, it's, it's more complicated, you know, you, as a researcher, uh, I can, um, you know, there's not maybe as much scrutiny, uh, uh, I'm, 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 you know, um, probably it's not important enough, you know, uh, <laughs> to get that kind of scrutiny, but um, doing research in China, you know, there are a lot of, I'll just say there's a lot of roadblocks uh, to doing research on this in China that are just put there automatically, like at the library. You know, can be hard to find stuff. It's there, but it's hard. You know, sometimes but it's, it's hard to find. And uh, sometimes people will come into the room and look over your shoulder and try to figure out, you know, what you're doing. Um, you can be much more efficient. Uh, and, I, and I've done this. You know, um, uh, basing the research in multiple locations. I mean, that's that's, that's a luxury. Um, but uh, the, the best materials and the most efficient research I've done in Taiwan, uh, Malaysia, Singapore. Uh, and the United States. In China, like I said, the materials are there, but it's much more time intensive just trying to get to it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Should I call on people? The microphone is calling on people. Okay. <laughs> um, I, that was great. Thank you. Um, I have a question that actually was kind of triggered by some other questions. Um, and looking at, again, the diversity of the sort of range of sources coming in the 1930s, I was wondering whether um, with, with, with OPEC and with the sort of tremendous amount of money that the Saudis have and the Arabization of Islam and Islamic architecture that's been happening as a result, has the, the, has the Chinese regime sort of embraced the distinctiveness of Chinese Muslims as opposed to, as a way of sort of uh, rejecting the Arabization of Islam? It, that's a great question too. It depends. Um, I, first of all, it depends. Second of all, it's, it's also changing very quickly. So um, a couple of years ago, uh, Kyle, our, our, who, who we'll talk here later this week, uh, also had an article about this. There was the, you know, the One Belt, One Road, like Chinese Muslim Expo in uh, Ningxia, which is the Chinese Muslim uh, autonomous region, um, uh, a few years ago. Uh, and, and that was sort of, as you said, this official co-optation of 
the fact that there are Muslims in China. And they're, they're hoping to attract Arab dignitaries, uh, Central Asian dignitaries to come and, and see this, and that this would be a, a sort of um, cultural basis for uh, further business ties. Um, now, just a couple of years after that, uh, as I said, um, Xi Jinping's government has uh, uh, said, uh, you know, we can't have any more, any more Arabic uh, style in the mosque architecture. And um, there were some restrictions on um, also fasting during Ramadan. A, a journalist, a friend of mine in Beijing, uh, found this. Um, restrictions on Hui, on Chinese Muslims, not just on Uyghurs, restrictions on fasting uh, during Ramadan for, uh, 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 in the past year. Um, so, uh, yeah, things are, it, so it isn't just like, you know, the Uyghurs have it tough and the way have it better. It, it, things are changing uh, uh, pretty quickly. Um, but the question of the Saudis, uh, China, Chinese Muslims in Northwestern China will say, we, we funded all of, all of this construction ourselves. Um, I don't know what the truth is. Uh, I don't think it's just, a blanket, uh, you know. Yes, there is some Saudi money uh, coming in, but also um, uh, it is. A, but that that question is also extremely sensitive from the perspective of the state. So I think the the fact that the Chinese Muslims will insist we pay for all this ourselves uh, is the only thing that tells you something. I don't know what the truth is. How about the re-education re camps? Is it only for Muslim weekends or? Han and Hui Chinese also. Um, yeah, that's also a good question. I mean, uh, the, numerically, the vast majority have been um, Uyghurs so far. Uh, there was one story a couple months ago about a, um, a Hui Chinese Muslim poet who had uh, been put in a, in a re-education um, center for a time. Um, I'm not sure since then what, uh, I mean, that was the most prominent thing I've seen to, your, uh, to this question so far. Uh, and do you know what are the response of uh, other Islamic countries? I mean, a year ago, uh, Egypt complied completely with this, uh, as far as we can tell, with this um, Chinese request to deport the Uyghur students studying at Al-Azhar. So, um, you know, it, it, it varies, of course, uh, by yeah. country, but on, on the whole, um, I, I'm not the best person to ask for the details on this, but um, there's no clear Muslim country that is mm -hmm. saying this is wrong and this has to change. I, mean, I, I haven't seen. Um, if I'm wrong about that, I, I would love to be uh, corrected, but I think it's, um, you know, yeah, the commercial relationships are <laughs> very powerful. Uh, yeah, thank you again for such fascinating and rich uh, presentation. Um, uh, and, and you mentioned possibly about uh, sharing some of the bibliography. Uh, you, uh, you were mentioning some of the primary sources, but it would be great to get that. Absolutely. Um, I just have a, a random question. So you were talking about the um, participation of Arabic, I think you said in the, in the Uyghur um, uh, uh, populations. I just wondered, um, I don't know what the historicity of Tilawat or recitation of Quran is, but what, is there any talk about that? It would, because I know with my own students who are non-Arabic speaking, they, but there's a connection to Arabic that persists and then also is revived a lot of times. So I, I just wonder what, if there's any uh, primary source discussions of that or anything. Um, yeah, that, that, that's, that's a really good question. And it's, um, it's also a complicated uh, issue. Um, for Chinese Muslims, you have different practices. You, you do find, uh, before the 20th century, and, and into the 20th century, um, use of Chinese syllables to, I'm sorry I don't have an image of this, but use of Chinese syllables to approximate the sounds of Arabic so you can help people who only know Chinese to start out approximate the sounds of Arabic. That's used more in Eastern China, for Muslims in Eastern China. For Muslims in the frontiers, Chinese speaking Muslims in the frontiers, Chinese speaking Muslims on the frontiers, it was often the opposite. They, they had a system uh, like they knew Arabic script, but could only speak Chinese, but couldn't read Chinese. Um, so they would use a system called in Chinese called it uh which just I means like a, an approach to reading this, the, the the classic scripts. Um, so they, that, there they would use Arabic to write Chinese. 
Uh, so you have both of those. Um, here, you also have, um, yeah, Tajweed, right, the, uh, 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 the science of correct pronunciation of, um, of, of the Quran and other, other uh, um, texts. Uh, that also becomes an issue because uh, in different parts of China, the, for the reasons I said, I've said, the pronunciation of Arabic varies uh, widely. Uh, and knowledge of Arabic varies widely. I mean, a lot of Chinese Muslims will, will have will be given Arabic names, right? Uh, or will at least know how to pray in Arabic. But um, sometimes, it, when it comes out, it will actually be Chinese syllables, not you know. Uh, so, so that that's one of the concerns for the early 20th century Chinese Muslim reformers, the modernists. Uh, they they want everyone to um, learn proper Arabic for um, because that that makes you modern. Great okay, um, I don't have a terribly focused question. Um, I'm going to sort of seek a little bit of guidance here. Uh, for one thing, I think it's important that what you've brought out here about the importance of um, print publication in the 19th and 20th century among the modernists, it's, it shows really kind of a global movement that's often neglected in thinking about other, you know, the non-West. Um, that they, people were not drag kicking and screaming in the 20th century or something. They were thinking about these things as soon as, uh, through print media, through journalism and, and sort of renaissances of journalism. Um, so I think that's something to sort of think, up, think about globally as you look at, at uh, not just Muslim culture, but, but other cultures that were processing uh, some of these ideas that were coming out of uh, what sort of might call liberal reforms, modernist reforms, and so on. My question that's not very focused, though, is about um, a question I'm sort of exploring is what happens to Islam through this reform, modernizing and adapting to the nation state system? Um, we often decry the sort of lack of diversity, the sort of idea that you want to strip away the folk practices, strip away the mysticism, you know, get down just the facts, ma'am, and you know, the Arabic and this kind of thing. Do you observe that too in, in as a kind of trend of what's what's moving here? Yeah, it depends. Different um, what I've found is uh, different leading Chinese Muslims um, would pick up on uh, different aspects of Islamic modernism for different reasons. And it's, it's hard to generalize about why certain ones would pick up on some and, and others others. Uh, but um, one definite thing I have noticed is um, the Chinese Muslim elites who were closest to the Guomindang government, because um, that, that, that's the period I focus on the most. Um, the ones who were closest to the government actually, and I, I hesitate to say this because it sounds like a generalization, it's not meant to be a total generalization, but the ones who were closer to the government emphasized the, um, the strict orthodoxizing um, strains of Islamic modernism uh, more heavily. And the ones who were more skeptical of the government, it, it, it's intuitively not surprising, right? The ones who were a little bit more skeptical of what the elites were doing, a little more skeptical of what the government was doing, were more interested in the strains of Islamic modernism that focus on ishtihad, right? A reason, you know, the use of uh, human reason to navigate your own uh, personal and political circumstances in life. Um, uh, so that is what just just one <laughs> uh, thing that I did definitely observe in the sources. Yeah. Right. So there's this sort of you know trend tend of going against the idea that you know you. The problem with not being modern is that you're, you know, religious, and so kind of trying to do that, and, and loyalty to the state versus a sort of supranational ideal of, of religion is, is kind of a characteristic again that cuts across, you know, many of the dialogues and, and indeed shares literature. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, yeah, just a, another way to phrase what I'm just saying. I mean, like, yeah, the the elites who are more connected with the government want to help the government to. Sinicize the Muslims on the frontiers, right? And they see that as being the best way to secure Muslims in China, generally. Um, the ones who emphasize reason more, um, you know, they just they want Muslims in China to be better Muslims, and they will um, 
you know, they, they feel that the politics will improve automatically if they do that uh, first. Both extremely problematic <laughs> positions, right? <laughs> um, but I do see that. I do see that. I get that tension in the sources. Thank you.